Is our solar system stationary in the cosmos? With our feet firmly planted on the Earth, we might at first glance think that the universe around us is somewhat static. However, if we take the time to observe our celestial environment, there is no doubt that everything is in motion. Despite its peaceful appearance, our planet continues its frantic race through space, revolving around the shimmering sun. But what about our entire planetary system? Does it have a single cosmic address? Or is it part of the countless cogs that make up and organize our universe? To answer these questions, we're going to explore our solar system in all its nooks and crannies. We'll discover that it's much more than just a group of planets orbiting a star, and that it occupies a unique place at the heart of the Milky Way, which nonetheless counts over 200 billion stars. Dear Traveler, welcome. Today we're off on a spectacular journey through our galaxy. As you'll see, we're a long way from the center of the universe, which still holds many secrets. On this space expedition, we'll try to better understand our position in the cosmos. Fasten your seatbelt and open your eyes wide. Breathtaking celestial landscapes await us. But before we begin our interstellar adventure, remember to like the video and subscribe to the channel so you don't miss a thing. Thank you, and have a great trip! Our planet Earth is part of the Sun's planetary system. Our system is called solar because we use this adjective to characterize things or phenomena linked to our star. But what does the solar system actually represent? Although human beings have been studying the stars for thousands of years, it wasn't until 1543 that Nicholas Copernicus put forward the theory of heliocentrism, placing the Sun at the center of the then known universe with its orbiting satellites. For him, and rightly so, the Earth was not the center of the world. Then in the 1610s, Kepler not only confirmed this theory, but accurately defined the orbit of each of the planets orbiting our Sun. Later, Galileo made a revolutionary discovery thanks to a new invention, the telescope. While observing Jupiter, he discovered that the planet was surrounded by four stars. He soon deduced that these were in fact four moons orbiting the same planet. Copernicus's theory proved to be correct. The Earth is not the center of the universe, and the planets belonging to this system do indeed revolve around the Sun. Our solar system is therefore a collection of celestial objects, planets, and incidentally their moons, asteroids, and comets, orbiting a star to which they are gravitationally bound, the Sun. Our solar system contains eight planets, Mercury, Venus, our wonderful Earth, Mars, Jupiter, Saturn, Uranus, and finally Neptune, which lies 30.1 astronomical units from the Sun, more than 30 times the distance from Earth to Sun. It is also home to numerous dwarf planets, including Pluto, Ceres, Haumea, Eris, and Makemake. To this inventory, we can add dozens of moons and millions of asteroids, including those in the asteroid belt, as well as millions of comets and meteoroids.
Virtually all planets have one or more moons, with the exception of Mercury and Venus, the closest to the star. NASA has counted over 200, with many more yet to be confirmed. Even tiny asteroids have their own moons, while our Earth only has the one moon we can observe every evening, Saturn is home to 83, and Jupiter no less than 92. All of which makes them look like many planetary systems. Our solar system goes far beyond these eight planets. It also includes the Kuiper Belt which extends beyond Neptune's orbit, probably between 30 and 55 astronomical units. This immense but sparsely occupied ring includes the dwarf planet Pluto, virtually the largest of the icy objects in it. In recent decades, the global census of our solar system has been called into question. A ninth planet whose presence has never been proven could well lie beyond the orbit of Neptune. The hypothesis of its existence arose when scientists noticed that certain objects in the Kuiper Belt, which stretches to the edges of our solar system, had orbits that seemed to be influenced by an invisible star. Finally, our solar system is surrounded by a colossal spherical shell that completely encompasses it. This is the Oort cloud. Although it has never yet been observed, its presence has been established on the basis of mathematical models and observations of comets that appear to have originated there. This cloud, comprising some one trillion pieces of icy cosmic debris, some of which can be compared to mountains, orbits the Sun up to 1.6 light years away. Its relatively thick structure extends from 5,000 to 100,000 astronomical units. This cloud seems to mark the limit of our Sun's gravitational influence, as objects in it can turn around and approach the Sun again. However, the Sun's heliosphere, the bubble of electrically charged gases created by the solar wind, does not extend this far. In fact, the limit at which the solar wind undergoes abrupt deceleration is between 80 and 100 astronomical units. This sudden slowdown, known as terminal shock, is due to the pressure of the interstellar gases, which is then stronger than the winds, which have diminished at this distance. But how did all these objects come together to form the solar system as we know it today? Around 4.5 billion years ago, a particularly dense cloud of interstellar gas and dust collapsed, probably as a result of the shock wave caused by a supernova. This giant molecular cloud, several light years across, must have given birth to several stars, taking the form of a solar nebula comprising a disk of disordered matter. Gravity then sucked more and more matter into the center until the pressure in the core was such that hydrogen atoms began to produce helium, releasing a colossal amount of energy. Our Sun, which has accumulated over 99% of all usable matter, is the product of this process. The remaining matter, too far away to be absorbed, eventually clumped together in collisions to form objects large enough to be shaped by gravity into spheres. Depending on their mass, these objects are now catalogued as planets, dwarf planets, or even large moons. However, some objects have not joined up with any other and continue to roam our interplanetary space. These include asteroids, comets, meteoroids, and irregular moons.
The structure of our solar system is therefore intrinsically linked to its formation process. The first four planets to emerge from the Sun are telluric planets because only rocky material could withstand the heat of the young Sun. On the other hand, materials such as ice, liquid, or gas found refuge in the outer, much more distant regions. Then, in the same process, gravity brought them together to form Jupiter and Saturn, the gas giants, and Uranus and Neptune, the ice giants. All the objects in our solar system that form from the protoplanetary disk have thus remained on the same plane. And so, for the past 4.5 billion years, this small world has cohabited in this modest region of space. Each object follows a well-defined trajectory in this one-way zone, but they all share a common orbital plane, so they will probably never meet. However, one unusual object stands out from the rest. While many objects have highly inclined orbits, one has decided to orbit in the wrong direction. Nicknamed Drac, this object has an extremely inclined orbit of 103.5 degrees. It is one of the rare objects to have a retrograde orbit, which is generally found in certain comets, such as Halley's, which comes very close to the Sun. Drac, on the other hand, travels backwards in the Kuiper Belt, on a stable orbit, its distance around the Sun, ranging from 20 to 70 astronomical units. According to scientists, this object may have been dislodged from the inner Oort cloud by a disturbance of unknown type, before finding refuge in the Kuiper Belt. It could therefore be in transition, and if disturbed again, could become a Halley-type comet, coming even closer to the Sun on its future orbits. As we've just seen, our solar system has been shaped according to a clear pattern. Small rocky planets close to the Sun, large gaseous planets further away, and an asteroid belt separating them. Logically, this structure is easily explained, as the intense energy of our young Sun has pushed lighter elements such as hydrogen and helium towards the outer solar system, leaving only rocky material alongside. We might therefore be tempted to imagine that many other stellar systems have followed this same scenario. However, the many planetary systems studied so far seem to demonstrate that this is not the case. Our solar system is just one of billions in our galaxy, all with very different configurations. Our solar system, for example, is devoid of super-Earths, which are relatively common in many other planetary systems. According to the scientific community, the configuration of our solar system is due to the fact that Jupiter, after its formation, migrated within the system towards the Sun. But before becoming a hot Jovian planet, due to the gravitational interactions with Saturn, these same two planets were gently pushed outwards. This migratory journey would have squeezed out all the young super-Earths of the inner solar system, then possibly in formation. This is why our rocky planets, which only began to form later, turned out to be smaller than they would have been without these interactions. However, our galaxy is estimated to contain between 200 and 400 billion stars. Although this process doesn't seem to represent the norm, the chances of its having occurred near one of them are, after all, statistically not so slim.
We've just seen how the various objects in our solar system are organized in relation to the Sun. But what do we know about our position in the Milky Way? A priori, our Sun is less than 30,000 light years from Sagittarius A, the supermassive black hole that more or less marks the middle of our galactic disk. This distance is not easy to define, because to be able to make exact measurements, we'd have to get out of our own galaxy. But this is impossible. For a long time, the distance between the Sun and the black hole was estimated at 27,700 light years. Then, the Gravity Consortium reduced this distance to 26,673 light years. However, our Sun turns out to be even closer to Sagittarius A. Vera, the observatory's large telescope in Chile, with its incredible resolution of 10 microseconds of arc, which can theoretically glimpse a small coin on the lunar surface, has confirmed that our solar system is actually only 25,800 light years away from the center of the Milky Way. Our Sun takes 225 to 250 million years to complete one cosmic year, i.e. its full orbit around the Milky Way. It moves at a prodigious speed of around 828,000 kilometers per hour, or 514,000 miles per hour. In short, our solar system, following its orbit, moves some 20,000 kilometers or 12,000 miles in just 90 seconds. Since its birth, and despite this prodigious speed, it has made 20 complete circles of our galaxy, which is the largest galaxy in the local group after the Andromeda Galaxy. Our solar system is nestled in one of the galaxy's spiral arms, the Orion Arm also known as the Local Arm, where it lies midway between the edge and center of the Milky Way. This arm extends outwards from the Sagittarius Arm, one of the four major arms of our galaxy. However, this mapping of the galaxy could well be called into question. Studies conducted using the National Science Foundation's very long baseline array telescopes suggest that Orion's arm may well be larger than previously thought. It should no longer be seen as a small, spiky region of the galaxy, but rather as a major structure, probably a branch of the Perseus arm, or even an independent arm segment. Compared to the size of the Milky Way, which is estimated to be several tens of thousands of light years across, our solar system may seem extremely small, with a diameter of around 20 billion kilometers, or 12 billion miles, or about 130 astronomical units. However, this is not the case. NASA's Voyager 1 spacecraft, launched in 1977, took over 30 years to reach the edge of the heliosphere, despite reaching speeds of 61,500 kilometers per hour, or 38,000 miles per hour. This marks the limit beyond which the Sun's magnetic fields dissipate. However, if we consider that the boundary of our solar system lies at the point where the Sun's gravitational influence stops, Voyager 1 would have to pass through the Oort cloud before it could reach interstellar space. Our Sun may be dragging the planets and other objects of our solar system along with it, but the workings of the cosmos are far more complex than we've just seen. Indeed, everything in space, including our galaxy, is in constant motion. The Earth revolves around the Sun, which in turn orbits the Milky Way. This galactic monster, 
whose diameter is estimated at 120,000 light years, is similarly on the move in the local group, a collection of dozens of galaxies traveling at nearly 2.2 million kilometers per hour, or 1.3 million miles per hour. In the course of these incessant movements, some neighboring galaxies are gradually absorbed by the Milky Way. With between 200 and 400 billion stars, the Milky Way adopts new stars in addition to those it generates. Yes, new stars form regularly in the Milky Way, at the rate of seven every year. The most densely populated area of stars, gas and dust, lies at the center of our galaxy. In this galactic bulge, which stretches for thousands of light years, 10 billion stars, mostly old red giants, are tightly clustered. Close stellar encounters are therefore particularly common, occurring around once every 50,000 years, the individual trajectories of each star in the galactic disk sometimes bring them close together. Our solar system is no exception. The last close encounter was approximately 70,000 years ago. A binary system called the Schultz star came within 52,000 astronomical units of our Sun. This was the second time it had passed close to our Sun. Approximately 80,000 years ago, it had already approached the Sun by between 66,000 and 70,000 astronomical units, disrupting the Oort cloud and the orbits of certain comets and asteroids in the solar system. This resulted in the expulsion of numerous objects from the Oort cloud, some of which collided with our Earth, triggering major biological crises leading to the extinction of certain living species. Fortunately, these encounters have remained sufficiently distant for the time being to avoid even more damaging and destructive effects within our planetary system. A new question then arises, in which direction is our Sun moving in our galaxy? If we can predict the trajectories of other objects, our Sun's trajectory is essential for predicting potential stellar closures. The Milky Way, that gigantic barred spiral galaxy, houses our solar system in one of its majestic arms. Because of its location, the solar system could be situated at mid-galactic level compared to our Earth's equator. Indeed, our system is only about 20 light years above the galaxy's equatorial plane of symmetry. Many current estimates put the thickness of the galactic disk at around 1,000 light years. This means that our solar system is particularly close to the galaxy's equator. It is in this area of the galaxy's disk that most of its gas and dust is found. As a result, it's also where the majority of new stars are born. In a peaceful cosmic dance, our Sun tirelessly continues its journey. Unlike many other stellar objects, our star revolves around the galactic center in a virtually circular orbit. Its elepticity is low, estimated at just 5%. What's more, the Sun moves to the galaxy at an angle of around 60 degrees to the galactic plane. This inclination also applies to the planets orbiting the Sun. Consequently, if we observe the Sun and the plane in which all solar system objects orbit it, they are all tilted forward by 60 degrees as they travel through the Milky Way. At first glance, our movement through space resembles a vortex, giving the impression that we'll end up slowly approaching the central vortex of the Milky Way, when quite the opposite is true. But could it be 
that this movement is more than just a vortex? Gravity determines the behavior of every cosmic object, from the tiniest to the most gigantic. And since everything in the cosmos is mobile, it's extremely complicated to define the movement of stars and their distances from one another. We therefore need to define a reference frame from which we can draw conclusions. For example, the center of gravity of the masses of the solar system, also known as the Berry Center, is the reference point for describing the movements of the planets around us. However, things aren't quite so simple. For just as the Earth's rotation influences movements on its surface, planetary movements are also affected by the fact that this Berry Center itself follows a movement generated by the Milky Way, which itself is influenced by the local group to which it belongs and so on. Yes, the local group, massive as it is, is far from isolated, and other galaxies or clusters of galaxies in its vicinity attract us. Even the most distant clusters of matter exert their gravitational force, generating additional motions, which in turn have repercussions. Cosmic voids must also be taken into account, and cannot be ignored. They also influence the trajectories of individual objects through gravitational repulsion. Thus, a region of the cosmos that is very dense in matter or energy exerts an attractive effect, while a region that is less dense than another generates a repulsive force. But what's most surprising is that the Sun, in its never-ending path, doesn't draw a flat circle. In fact, as it moves through the galaxy, it rises and falls in a vertical motion across the galactic disk, drawing successive waves over periods of tens of millions of years. It behaves like a cork in the water, appearing sometimes inside, sometimes outside, the median plane of our galactic disk. Recent estimates put the Sun's current position at around 14 light years above the median plane of the galaxy. Once it has reached a height of more or less 300 light years above the galactic plane, it will again begin its descent through the median plane, ending up on the other side, before rising again and so on. Can the Sun's ceaseless movement have no effect on its environment? According to scientists at the Cardiff Center for Astrobiology in Wales, these bounces may well explain some of the major changes our planet Earth has undergone to date. After developing a computer model of our solar system's motion, the Cardiff team effectively confirmed that our Sun bounces up and down across the galactic plane. However, as our solar system passes through the densest zone of this region of the galaxy, the gravitational forces of the surrounding gigantic clouds of gas and dust disrupt the trajectories of the comets, knocking them out of their initial orbits. Some of these comets then plunge into our solar system and even collide with other objects including in some cases the Earth. What's more, this team of scientists has discovered that our Sun and its numerous satellites cross the galactic plane exactly every 35 to 40 million years. This frequency multiplies the risk of collision with a comet by a factor of 10. This hypothesis seems to be confirmed by the presence of terrestrial craters, which seem to occur in large numbers every 36 million years or so, especially as these periods of cometary bombardment coincide with the mass extinctions our planet has experienced. The non-avian dinosaur mass extinction of 65 million years ago comes to mind. Based on this frequency, we may be able to suggest that a good number of comets could reach our beautiful planet before long. 
but let's not see this as apocalyptic. Some even see potential positive impacts. For this group of researchers, this same episode of cometary bombardment could certainly have contributed greatly to the spread of life far beyond our Earth. Indeed, they suggest that, at the moment of the fatal impact, terrestrial debris containing microorganisms could have been hurled into space and thus across the universe. As a result, this theory implies that thanks to these interactions, the life that appeared on Earth could be dispersed on a galactic scale. What if, in the end, the conquest of space had already begun, unbeknownst to us, in this totally improbable way? And if we're still wondering where we stand in the universe since the 1970s and 1980s, researchers have established that our entire solar system is located in a gigantic cosmic structure, some 10 times less dense than the average, namely a vacuum-filled bubble, commonly known as the local bubble. The idea for this structure, which measures 1,000 light-years in diameter, comes from a simple observation by scientists. No stars have formed inside it, for 14 million years, some of the stars inside were already in existence, while others were probably created on the outside and then penetrated through its envelope, as our sun would have done. For many years, the existence of this bubble has greatly puzzled researchers, but now we may know why such a bubble appeared in this region of space. Scientists have discovered that the history of the local bubble began exactly 14.4 million years ago with the formation of stars. 15 or so of these, as they disappeared, triggered supernovas. The energy generated during their explosion pushed the interstellar matter away, forming this bubble inside which the temperature is higher than outside. Interstellar density was also found to be lower than outside this structure. The surface of this growing bubble, which expands at a speed of 6.7 kilometers per second, or 4 miles per second, is dense with hydrogen and helium, enabling the formation of young stars in this region of space. Today, our solar system is right in the middle of this bubble, but this was not the case when it was formed. It was far enough away at the time of these spectacular supernovas. However, its path, by pure chance, led it to this precise spot in the Milky Way nearly five million years ago. But there's nothing exceptional about this bubble of emptiness. Space is full of such bubbles, which lead to the formation of new stars and planets, and affect the overall shape of galaxies. The Milky Way contains many more such super bubbles. But what role do they play in star formation, and more broadly, in the shape of galaxies? By mapping these bubbles, scientists will be able to establish their shape, size, and location. And why not define their modes of interaction? This is what a team of astronomers from the Harvard and Smithsonian Center for Astrophysics has attempted to do by creating the first 3D map of this superbubble's magnetic field. Indeed, for scientists, magnetic fields undoubtedly play a primordial role in all kinds of astrophysical phenomena. By combining data from several space missions, including Gaia, they are now able to observe the polarization of light in the vicinity of our solar system. The polarization produced by magnetically aligned dust particles makes it possible to establish the orientation of the magnetic field acting on them, and thus provide some understanding of the influences of magnetic fields in the cosmos.
All these interactions sometimes lead to close visits between different cosmic objects. Halley's Comet is one of the most famous examples. It has been mentioned since 600 BC, and its first recorded appearance was in China. Later, during its most spectacular passage in 837, it was described in Chinese, Japanese, and European writings. For a long time, Halley's Comet was considered to be several separate objects, as it passed over and over again. In 1705, Edmund Halley published a book suggesting that all these successive comets, observed in 1531, 1607, and 1682, were in fact a single comet. He then predicted that it would again be observable in our planetary environment every 76 years. Sixteen years after his death, in 1758, Halley's Comet kept its appointment. Although Edmund Halley was unable to witness its triumph, Nicolas Louis de Lacaille, the famous French astronomer, proposed that the comet be named Comet de Halley. This object, whose nucleus is composed of a mixture of ice and dust grains, has an irregular shape measured at 16 kilometers in length and 8 kilometers, or 5 miles in width. On its rugged surface, craters release the gases and dust that feed its hair and tail, which mark our night sky during its visits, the last of which dates back to 1986. If you've already done the math, you've probably estimated that it will make another visit to our neighborhood in 2061. This periodic comet will then be at the perihelion of its elliptical orbit which brings it only 0.59 astronomical units closer to the Sun, while its distance to aphelion puts it at 35.3 astronomical units further away. While comets orbiting more or less far from our Sun visit us regularly, other objects only seem to present themselves to us during a unique and spectacular journey. A recent study claims that many interstellar objects, though rare, have probably entered our relatively ancient solar system. It's also possible that some of these interstellar objects were captured for a time by our solar system when they were merely passing through us. But according to the same study, there could be a stable population of interstellar objects orbiting close to Earth. The study of these objects, which exhibit a unique mechanism, may provide an opportunity to study the formation and evolution of planetary systems, including our own. Two of these interstellar objects have recently been observed, Oumuamua, which was discovered in 2017, and Comet Borisov, whose existence was confirmed in 2019. Oumuamua is the very first interstellar object in the history of astronomy to have been detected. Discovered thanks to Hawaii's Pan-STARRS telescope, it was given its name because Oumuamua means messenger in the Hawaiian language. Its hyperbolic trajectory and abnormally high speed establish that it does indeed come from another star and that it is crossing our solar system for the first and only time. Astronomers who have always been on the lookout for such an incursion were greatly surprised by their observations. Indeed, they had expected to study an object which, like a comet, would have been composed of ice and dust, formed at some distance from its host star, and therefore easily expelled during gravitational perturbations and their findings left them perplexed, to say the least. Asteroid? Comet? Or anything else? To begin with, Oumuamua lacks the usual attributes of a comet. The object, whose size is estimated at between 400 and 800 meters, or 1300 and 2600 feet in length, and 100 meters, 
or 330 feet in width, has neither a dusty tail nor a coma, i.e. a shiny head of hair marking its wake. These features are characteristic of celestial objects with icy cores that emerge as they approach the sun. Oumuamua also stood out for its brilliance and wide variations in brightness, giving the impression of a metallic object spinning on itself. What's more, this object, whose elongated appearance makes it resemble a huge domed cigar, is moving along a trajectory too elliptical for the acceleration observed to be solely gravitational in origin. In fact, when Oumuamua approached our Sun and began to move away from it, heading towards the constellation of Pegasus, it accelerated to over 300,000 kilometers per hour, or 186,000 miles per hour, while deviating from its original trajectory. This acceleration, which could be explained neither by the gravitational kick provided by the Sun, nor by an outgassing phenomenon, has even given rise to theories beyond the imagination of some astronomers. Could it be an extraterrestrial vessel? The idea caused quite a stir, intriguing the entire planet. However, since 2019, the natural origins of this unlikely object have been confirmed. This strange visitor, resembling an asteroid but behaving like a comet, has finally given up some of its secrets after numerous analyses carried out by researchers working on this troubling case. They established that the Oumuamua object was indeed compatible with the behavior of a standard interstellar comet, but one that had undergone significant alteration. Composed essentially of rock and water ice, like all comets known to date, Oumuamua would have been expelled far from its star's gravitational grip. After wandering in the interstellar medium for probably tens of millions of years, it would have been exposed for a long time to cosmic rays with highly energetic particles penetrating tens of meters beneath its surface ice. Under the effect of these rays, a certain quantity of the water particles present would have been transformed into molecular hydrogen. The latter, which would have remained trapped in the object's ice, would then have turned into gas when the distance to the sun was only 37 million kilometers, or 23 million miles. By escaping on its own, this gas would then have generated the thrust seen during Oumuamua's acceleration, but without leaving any halo or trail, as other comets do. Not all scientists are convinced by this explanation, however, as some do not believe that a comet can be deprived of its specific attributes. Could this exception be explained by Oumuamua's small size? At least that's what some members of the scientific community are saying. Future observations by the Vera C. Rubin Telescope in Chile, due to begin in 2025, should reveal new comets, both inside and outside our solar system. If the smallest of them show signs of releasing trapped hydrogen without having a luminous tail, then this theory can be confirmed and Oumuamua will definitely no longer be considered a potential asteroid. The second interstellar object to be examined was Comet Borisov. It was captured by amateur astronomer Gennady Borisov on August 30, 2019. Unlike Oumuamua with its puzzling properties, Borisov was quickly identified as a comet. What makes it special? It's the first observed comet not to originate from our solar system. What's more, Astronomers suggest that it never came close to a star, making it an intact remnant of the cloud of gas and dust from which it originated. In short, it is the purest comet ever studied. The outgassing observed as it approached our Sun was certainly the first it had undergone in its entire existence. 
yet Borisov is no ordinary comet. Its polarimetric observation, compared with that of our local comets, has led to the conclusion that it has polarimetric properties that differ from those of our local comets, with the exception of comet Hale-Bopp. The latter, which belongs to our solar system, had already aroused the curiosity of astronomers as the most intact comet ever observed. The fact that these two comets are remarkably similar in composition suggests that the environment in which Borisov formed is not so different in terms of composition from that in which our solar system formed. However, where this comet came from remains a mystery that will probably never be solved, as Borisov, currently near Saturn, is speeding away from our solar system on a one-way trip. Our solar system is therefore visited by numerous intruders. However, some objects belonging to the solar system are just as exciting. This is particularly true of Comet Ison, which was discovered in September 2012, but which unfortunately came to a tragic end. This comet, born 4.5 billion years ago, in the disk of gas and dust that surrounded our recently formed Sun, is therefore a comet belonging to our solar system. It survived the innumerable collisions that raged at the time, finding its way through all manner of scattered and chaotic objects until it found refuge in the margins of the solar system, within the Oort cloud for billions of years. But then, around three million years ago, a star came close enough to gravitationally disturb it. This slight disturbance was enough to alter its destiny, leading it straight to certain destruction. Sometimes dubbed the Comet of the Century, its trajectory brought it to within 1.1 million kilometers or 600,000 miles of the Sun's surface on November 28, 2013. Its nucleus, estimated to be less than one kilometer or 0.6 miles in diameter, could not withstand the star's violent forces. Ison literally disintegrated However, observations in interplanetary space of dust resulting from this fatal approach should enable the scientific community to unravel some of Ison's dirty secrets. Astronomers are also keeping a close eye on another object. It's 2023 KW2 an asteroid that came hurtling towards us, skimming past the Earth on June 6th. This giant asteroid, a member of the Apollo family, which has been observed since its discovery on April 16th, 2023, could have had a destructive impact if it had collided with the Earth. Measuring between 50 and 111 meters in diameter and traveling at a speed of 36,000 kilometers per hour, or 22,000 miles per hour, it fortunately stayed well away from our beautiful planet at around 4.53 million kilometers, or 2.7 million miles. This asteroid, which orbits the Sun in 1,124 days, will again be observable from Earth by the year 2,189, Objects of this type regularly cross our trajectory, as our solar system is dotted with asteroids of varying dimensions, most of them fortunately minimal in size. Some, however, are considered potentially dangerous due to their size, at least 150 meters, and their orbit, which brings them to within 7.5 million kilometers of the Earth's orbit around the Sun. According to the Center for Near-Earth Object Studies, CNEOS, at NASA's Jet Propulsion Laboratory, which tracks near-Earth objects, five asteroids approached our planet very recently. One of them, the largest, 
was an estimated 488 meters long. More importantly, it passed us at just 4.3 million kilometers, or 4.7 million miles, and at a speed of 36,000 kilometers per hour, or 22,000 miles per hour. This giant class near-Earth object, which grazed us between June 14th and 18th, 2023, has been named Asteroid 2020 DB5. Yet this visit was not the first. This asteroid has already made six passes through our planetary neighborhood since 1905. Its last visit was on June 23rd, 1995, so it's safe to conclude that it will return to greet us on May 2nd, 2048. According to NASA, no fewer than 472 asteroids of this type, measuring over 140 meters or 460 feet, have been discovered to date. Scientists, on the other hand, don't think that's enough. They estimate that there are probably still 15,000 to be found. It remains to be seen whether one of these objects, whose trajectories do not seem worrying today, could one day, for one reason or another, represent a real threat to our planet. For as long as mankind has been aware of the dangers coming from outer space, certain extraterrestrial objects have caused significant planetary and biological damage. We've just mentioned comets in particular, which sometimes pass through our solar system grazing our Earth. But what about nearby stars? Could a star come close enough to us to disturb our planet? Nothing is set in stone in the universe. Consequently, as our solar system moves through the Milky Way, which itself moves through the cosmos, closer approaches are inexorable. The trajectories of the various stars, albeit at distances often measured in millions or billions of kilometers, inevitably cross paths, sometimes bringing them closer together, with varying consequences. Even if stars don't collide, they influence each other according to their own paths. For a star to begin impacting our solar system, it would have to be nearly 60 trillion kilometers away, depending on its mass and speed. In this case, it would disturb the Oort cloud, our reservoir of comets. This would alter the usual trajectory of comets, some of which could be expelled as far as our inner solar system, and consequently, towards our beautiful planet Earth. This is why understanding the movement of the stars that populate the Milky Way is essential. Of the more than 300,000 stars surveyed by ESA's Gaia satellite, scientists are analyzing their closest position to our Sun. It turns out that 97 of them will be closer to our Sun in the next few million years at around 150,000 billion kilometers, or 93,000 billion miles, and 16 others at 60,000 billion kilometers, or 38,000 billion miles, the famous limit that must not be crossed for the preservation of our system. According to their estimates, scientists suggest that the overall encounter rate is around 550 stars per million years within a radius of 150,000 billion kilometers or 93,000 billion miles over a period of 5 million years past or future. We can therefore expect a potential encounter approximately every 50,000 years. Now that's reassuring, particularly as there is no evidence to suggest that such a close encounter generates cometary disturbances in the Oort cloud, or that these same comets head for the inner regions of our solar system. As a result, it is impossible to know whether the Earth will ever be endangered or not.
However, one star stands out from the rest. This is Gliese 710, detected several years ago by the Hipparco satellite. It is hurtling towards our solar system and is expected to pass through the Oort cloud in just over a million years. Complementary data collected by the Gaia satellite estimates its passage through our immediate vicinity in exactly 1.35 million years. Its trajectory within the Milky Way leads it straight towards the center of our solar system. This orange dwarf star, half the size of our Sun, will cause a gravitational upheaval in the Oort cloud. It will probably take several million years for the comets that have been quietly gathering there to regain their composure. Dozens of comets will be visible to the naked eye every year, for a long time to come. While this shower of comets promises a cosmic spectacle of great beauty, it is to be feared that many of these comets will cause cosmic collisions, some reaching the planets of our solar system. The Earth, too, could well be hit many times by some of these objects lost in space. Following its trajectory, Gliese 710 will pass close to our Sun at a distance of just 0.2 light years, or 77 light days. While this distance may seem staggering, in reality, it's extremely close on the scale of the universe. The passage of a star at such a small distance from our Sun is unlikely to cause any disruption to the main objects of the solar system. Its structure will not be threatened, and the planets will maintain their usual motion. This is the first time in living memory that a star will pass so close to our Sun. Gliese 710, which by then will have a magnitude of minus 2.7, will shine as brightly as the planet Mars when at its closest to the Earth. For the time being, it is still 62 light years away and can be observed in the direction of the Serpent constellation. Although other stars will probably be approaching in the coming millennia, they will all be at least three light years away, which should reassure you. Yes, Close encounters between stars are not uncommon in the Milky Way. The latest star to approach our solar system is a dwarf with a mass 15 times less than that of the Sun. It passed within 0.82 light years of our star nearly 70,000 years ago, but due to its low mass, the Oort cloud was hardly disturbed. The next star to approach the Sun from just over three light years away is Proxima Centauri. It will be followed on a cosmic scale by Ross 248, just under three light years away, some 16,000 years later, in around 36,000 years. As we become aware of all the possible interactions between the various cosmic objects, but above all of their potentially apocalyptic consequences, one question is on everyone's lips. Is it possible to predict the end of the world? Or at least the disappearance of existence as we know it on our blue planet? Since the dawn of humanity, prophecies have foretold the end of times. No fewer than 183 world endings have been prophesied by heralds from all walks of life, and that's just since the fall of the Roman Empire. Not a single civilization has escaped these tragic predictions, which fortunately for us have all turned out to be wrong. In fact, You'll remember the one that prompted the making of a number of disaster movies, including the famous 2012, or The Day After Tomorrow. According to some oracles, the end of the world was predicted for December 21st, 2012. The Mayans also predicted radical global change on that date. Indeed, according to one of the oldest calendars in history belonging to this civilization, the winter solstice of 2012 
marked the end of the world as we know it today. This civilization, for whom time was of paramount importance, used several calendars, including a calendar that gave rise to the famous speculations about the end of the world. The Maya's extremely precise calendar system is based on their cosmogonic beliefs, in which their deities constantly reconfigured the world. If it enabled them to define the period of creation in which we now find ourselves, skillful calculations based on the origin of this cycle of exactly 5,125 years meant that the end of the cycle corresponded to December 21st, 2012 in our current calendar. But this cyclical calculation of Mayan time, which was essentially based on the observation of the stars, simply highlighted the end of one of their cycles and consequently the beginning of a new one. While the enigma of the Mayan calendar seems to have been solved, the date of December 21st, 2012 has long been on people's minds. Some have deduced that our solar system probably crossed the galactic plane on that precise date. But what's the truth? As you know, our galaxy is flat and round like a wafer. In fact, our sun moves in and out of the galactic plane on a regular basis. Astronomers who have studied this question are quite clear. Not only did our solar system not crisscross this area of the galaxy on December 21st, 2012, but we are actually moving away from the galactic plane. According to their estimates, not only did we cross it for the last time around 3 million years ago, but we won't do so again, not for more than 30 million years. By moving away from the galactic plane, we also reduce the risk of collisions. Indeed, when our solar system is outside the galactic plane, and even further away from it, the influence of galactic tides is at its weakest. On the other hand, every 33 million years or so, when we are at the height of their influence, the flow of comets from the Oort cloud increases fourfold. This influence remains moderate, however, because while we are indeed quite close to the galactic plane at present, the last major extinction event on planet Earth was 66 million years ago. Scientists therefore believe that the Sun's vertical position in relation to the galactic plane alone can explain the periodic extinctions experienced to date. The culprits are undoubtedly the spiral arms, home to a large number of molecular clouds, but also to a greater concentration of blue giant stars. When our solar system passes through these gigantic clouds, the latter's gravity interacts with and considerably disturbs our Oort cloud. Above all, the blue giants, which turn out to be relatively short-lived, explode violently in this zone. And we know the devastating effects that supernovae can have on nearby objects, even at great distances. In fact, some researchers believe that our solar system is currently moving through a supernova debris cloud. This conclusion was reached after analyzing sediment samples taken from our ocean floor. During its long journey, our solar system regularly comes into contact with interstellar matter. Some of this interstellar matter is made up of radioactive elements expelled into space during supernovas, which are then deposited on other nearby objects, such as asteroids, or enter the atmosphere of planets like Earth. After focusing on a very specific isotope, Iron 60, which is not naturally present on our planet, they were able to assert that our planet has indeed 
been the distant witness of various supernova explosions over the last few million years. Their numerous studies have detected traces of Iron 60 deposited on our planet's surface around 2.5 million years ago, and probably others around 6 million years ago. Their synthesis leads us to believe that the Earth has traveled over the last few million years through various clouds of matter attributed to supernovae. Some German researchers have even reported that our solar system has been moving for several million years through a denser cloud of gas and dust, the origins of which are still unknown. This is the local interstellar cloud. Another group of researchers from the Technical University of Munich has also detected the Iron 60 isotope in snow samples from Antarctica. However, these are just a few traces. According to scientists, only 60 grams of Iron 60 stardust have reached the Earth's surface over the last 33 millennia. For the record, traces of this rare isotope had already been discovered in lunar soil samples collected and brought back to Earth by astronauts on several Apollo missions. Scientists are doing their utmost to discern how our solar system behaves by understanding its inner workings and its many interactions with all kinds of other cosmic objects they will be able to anticipate future events. Numerous simulations attempt to determine how the planets close to the Sun will behave in the billions of years to come. Some predict that Mercury's orbit will lengthen to the point of crossing that of Venus, but without further disrupting the planetary system. However, we can also imagine the most cataclysmic scenarios if Mercury were to disrupt the orbits of the surrounding planets, we could expect terrible collisions, perhaps even between Earth and Mars. However, a more recent study in 2009 showed that it is highly likely that Mercury would simply be absorbed by the Sun or collide with Venus. Still, according to this study, there is only a 1% probability that Mercury will enter secular resonance with Jupiter and cause interplanetary chaos over the next 5 billion years. Like all other stars, our Sun has a limited lifespan. It will therefore undergo major transformations in the very distant future. In a billion years' time, the shining sun, which provides the heat our planet needs, will transform into a red giant star. Its size will then increase 100-fold, and an intense stellar wind will strip the giant of much of its mass. Finally, all that will remain is a tiny, hot, extremely dense white dwarf, no bigger than the Earth. The impact on the planetary system will be considerable not to say apocalyptic, especially for the inner system. According to mathematical models, Mercury and Venus will probably be absorbed by the star, which will then become a giant. As for the Earth, a rocky planet, a little further away than its predecessors, it may survive this metamorphosis and continue to orbit the Sun, now a solar white dwarf. However, the intensity of the latter will transform our planet into a land hostile to all forms of life. This theory is based on a study carried out by an international team of astronomers who observed L2 Puppis, an old star that may well resemble our Sun at the end of its life. Five billion years ago, L2 Puppis was our Sun's near-perfect twin. Today, however, it has lost a third of its mass. A second source has been detected, almost 300 million kilometers, 
or 185 million miles from this star. Its relatively low mass suggests that it is either a planet or a small brown dwarf. The presence of this planet-like object in the disk of L2 Puppis represents a great opportunity for scientists. Careful study of its behavior and interactions with the star over the next few years should provide scientists with valuable information. They will then be able to determine not only the final evolution of the Sun, but also its impact on the planets of the solar system. The question is whether or not the Earth will be able to survive the disappearance of our Sun. But let's take a closer look at how the planets, and our Earth in particular, will be affected by this metamorphosis. We know that the Sun is warming up very slowly and that it is 30% brighter than it was shortly after its formation. This increase in brightness will only increase exponentially over the next few million years. This warming will have a direct impact on our planet. Life on Earth requires water in its liquid state. To maintain water as it is on the planet's surface, there needs to be a certain balance between incoming and outgoing energy in order to maintain adequate average temperatures. Unfortunately, this balance will be severely compromised by increasing the solar luminosity, and the Earth will slowly but surely warm up. Massive evaporation of water will trigger an unprecedented greenhouse effect, further warming the planet's surface. By this time, the oceans will have vaporized completely, making the Earth even hotter. Liquid water will have disappeared from the planet's surface within one to two billion years. Under these conditions, life as we know it will no longer be able to exist. Then, in around five billion years' time, the Sun's core will run out of hydrogen, and it will swell into a red giant. The star will then be colder than before, but its luminosity, as we've already seen, will be much greater. The habitable zone of our solar system will then be pushed outwards to encompass Jupiter and Saturn. The orbits of the inner planets will be powerfully disrupted, leading them straight towards the destructive star. As the Sun's gravity becomes weaker and weaker, the orbits of the outer planets will naturally widen. Our Sun, now a red giant, will expand to the point where it extends as far as the Earth's current orbit. What will become of our beautiful planet? Will it in turn be absorbed by this star at the end of its life, having been totally burnt out? Or will it reach a more distant orbit? No one can yet claim to know the answer. As for the Sun, it will continue its metamorphosis. Its core will contract until pressure and temperature cause the helium to melt. After a few flashes, only the core will remain. In around 7 billion years, the Sun will have become a small white dwarf, with all eternity to cool down slowly. It will have lost almost 40% of its current mass the planetary system will have doubled in size, but as we've just seen, some planets will have disappeared from the map. Neptune's orbit will no longer be located at 30, but at 55 astronomical units, marking the new, outer limit of the planetary system. It's easy to imagine that this new arrangement of planets will finally prove peaceful. The chaotic, inner part of the solar system will have been absorbed by the Sun, and the remaining planets will follow an almost circular orbit. But for how long? Neptune, which will probably be 55 astronomical units from the Sun by then, could well suffer a gravitational kick 
that would take it away from our planetary system forever. For this to happen, another star would have to pass within 500 astronomical units. If this star were to move to 200 astronomical units, it could even have a significant effect on the remaining planets. In many simulations, Jupiter could well be the last planet left in our solar system, the others having been propelled into interstellar space, destined to remain wandering planets forever. Nor can we rule out the possibility that a few billion years later, Jupiter will suffer the same fate as its former companions. The close passage of another star is not unlikely. The countdown is on, and has been since the Sun first appeared. Although it's difficult to grasp the fact that stars are not eternal, every star has a limited lifespan, and our Sun, like all the others, will not escape its destiny. Fortunately for us, this fatal outcome will only occur after a long, long transmutation process. Until then, our solar system continues its cosmic waltz through the Milky Way, accompanied by an extraordinary number of galactic objects, each more prodigious than the last. Our starry sky, bathed in a gentle warmth, still has a few hundred million years ahead of it. Do you think mankind will live to see those distant times? And if so, Will we have succeeded in the challenge we have already set ourselves to discover other habitable regions of space that are now within reach? <laughs>